So well, welcome back everyone and let's look further on here at what we've begun to discover about optics. So we found that this biconvex lens, this effectively continuously varying triangular prism will produce an image. And now as you can understand uh, from uh, just basic logic, yeah, this could be shaped somewhat differently and create distorted images and so on. But we're going to stick with uh, a spherical lens <clears throat> that is what we call thin. So what that means is that <clears throat> this distance here is small compared to this distance here. Okay? <clears throat> and the uh, focus therefore is, is comparatively long. Now the reason we do this <clears throat> is because we want to keep the mathematics simple. When you get into uh, more distortions you have to uh, the simplifications that we're making with respect to our similar triangles and so on fall apart and you have to deal with more complicated issues. I should add of course further that this is two-dimensional here but real lenses are three-dimensional and then the requirement to determine these <clears throat> bends requires calculus so the this is why we generally don't move in optical study much beyond what we're doing here in this course in high school because the math very quickly requires advanced techniques but we can still learn a fair bit uh, in our quasi simplified universe so once again we have, this is the convergence point that we saw yesterday and the last time, the convergence. <clears throat> of rays. Now notice I have it on both sides because clearly the light could come from this side and be form an image here or we could have light on this side form an image here. So there is a symmet symmetry here that's not, you know, makes sense. The observer would be on one side and the object would be on the other and so forth <clears throat> for most cases. We have the point at the center of the lens called the optical center. <clears throat> we have of course like the focus and twice the distance from the focus is 2f and this is in both cases and the line down the center here is known as the principal axis. <clears throat> now what we're going to find is that if the object is beyond 2f in between or inside we get images that have different character and we're going to have to think about that a little bit but to do so we have to come up with some basic ray tracing guidelines <clears throat> one a ray through the optical center is not refracted Now you might say, well, how do we know that? Well, <clears throat> if you think about it, if you run a ray, this is really just going through a horizontal block at this point here. <clears throat> and these prisms here are very close to parallel. So you, because we have a thin lens, we're going to get a trivial amount of image shift, which we're going to ignore. An incident ray parallel to the opt uh, to the principal axis is <clears throat> refracted through the opposite focus. Now that's, uh, <clears throat> and of course this goes backward, converse, so three, uh, so two <clears throat> works in reverse. So if we have a ray that's somehow coming from another place through the focus, 
it'll be refracted parallel to the principal axis. Okay? And that's pretty much it. We don't have to uh, think a lot farther than that. So let's uh, rub some stuff out here and make uh, some basic diagrams and see if we can understand what's going on. <clears throat> so the first case we'll have here is where the object is beyond uh, 2F. So we'll take our axis, we'll just make the lens aligned, keep it simple here. We have our foci on either side, make things a bit longer. Here's 2F and F. And so we're going to put our <coughs> object right here. And so let's trace out these rays and see what we get. <clears throat> so once again, how do we know where the image forms? When the rays from this point all come to a point in, at the same point in the image, that's where the image is going to be. If it's not there, then the image will be smeared. So I'll show you what I mean again. We've talked about it already, but let's just do it again. So here's this parallel ray here. It hits the lens and it goes through the focus. But here is a ray that goes through the optical center and crosses here. And now we have a point where the ray, two rays from the tip of the arrow go about their business, go through this lens, and at this point they recombine. At this instant, in this location, and nowhere else, all the information from this point is returned here. <clears throat> now, you can take other points down the arrow, and you will get corresponding points down the image. We generally don't draw them because it makes the diagram complicated. We could other. <clears throat> there would be, of course, other rays. We could have, for example, a ray from here that would also work. Let's do this one. We could do this too. A ray could come from here through the focus, hit the lens, and will be refracted parallel. So those are three <coughs> rays that go where they're supposed to go, so to speak, based on the guidelines in the previous panel. Notice and I didn't draw it yet, but we have uh, our focus point would be here. This is F. Uh, two F's about here. So this image is inverted. And it's actually smaller. It's harder to see. You can, of course, do all these things to scale uh, with circles and so on. <clears throat> it's projectable so it's real and it's between <clears throat> uh, F and 2F. One of the nice things about this situation is that these are reciprocal. So <clears throat> situation of item 1 is reversed for an object located uh, between 2F and F. <clears throat> we can see this here. Here's our object here, and its image then will be beyond 2F. So we can, without even having to draw the diagram, we'll see once again that the image is inverted in the sense that it's opposite in orientation to the object. It's larger 
the reverse. Uh, it's real, of course. And now it's beyond uh, 2F. <coughs> <clears throat> we might see what might the applications be. Well, this could be a, uh, a camera lens. Or, uh, and of course, there's more complexity to telescopes, but let's use that one. This could be a projection lens. And we could set this up if we're careful that this distance is quite a ways off and that would make this much bigger. So this would be the example of a, of a projector. <clears throat> Let's look at, for the final one on this panel, Let's look at the case where the object is right at the focus. It's amazing, but maybe you haven't studied optics before, but you actually already know what's going to happen here. You've probably had this experience. <clears throat> so here's the object. So we'll do the same old story here. The ray comes through, and we'll go through F and keep on going. We have another ray that will come through the optical center, but what we find, these rays are parallel. And because <clears throat> the rays from this point never can return together, no image is formed. Now you've you experienced this. If you take a magnifying glass, a, a, a standard magnifying glass, which is basically the lens we're looking at here, and you are holding it looking at a postage stamp or something and you back away if you back away a long way everything looks smaller and looks upside down and then you come in and there's, there's a change <clears throat> and suddenly at a certain point the whole thing goes just completely blurred and then suddenly you see this magnification effect and this blurred situation is when no image is formed and that's because you're basically at the focal length of the lens. Now we have to be a little careful <clears throat> about the assumptions we make because remember, our eyes have two lenses, the, cor the, cor the cornea and the uh, lens itself. And so what we're seeing, of course, is an image in our eye that's created also on top of whatever else these lenses might be doing. So we have to be a little careful but we're still in one way or another encountering this transition. All right, let's clear the panel here and we'll do one more. <clears throat> now let's take a look at this case, which is more confusing for most students. The object is here, which is between F and the lens and I drew the lens again just to show it a bit more a bit more effectively in detail. We take the rays, the three rays from the tip of this arrow that we know already. One ray would go through the lens and keep on going. Another would go parallel to the principal axis, would be refracted through the focus. Another one would go through the optical center. Now if you stand on this side you're not going to see anything because the light that is, well actually that, I should say, that's a silly thing to say. If I stand on this side, <clears throat> okay, what, what am I seeing here? I'm seeing three rays that are diverging. Now, we have to understand that the eye does not understand that the lens bends the light. We do not see this bend in the path. Okay? We do not, we don't notice that. All it does, by doing so, is to make an object feel, look bigger or smaller or whatever. However, in this case, the image, because these are diverging, 
there is no projection image on this side. There's no projectable image. The image then appears behind and is seen by an observer. So we'll draw the, the eye, if you will, of the observer here. Looking backwards uh, towards this. And now what happens is, and this is where we have, it's a little harder, is you can take these three rays, which we've already used, and extrapolate them backwards from assuming though no refraction at all, okay? And they will converge right here. And this produces a virtual image that is larger. And this is, of course, your magnifying glass. So this particular one, so if the object then is inside uh, F, then we get an erect image. It is larger. It is also inside F. <clears throat> and the image type here <clears throat> is uh, virtual. So that's a bit of a different <clears throat> situation, uh, but you do see the magnification. I'm going to show you another one uh, in a few minutes where we also get the optical effects of these extrapolations, so to speak. But let's do one more lens. And this is <clears throat> an opposite case where we use the same the same geometry <clears throat> only we make it what we call concave these were the other was a convex lens we still have F and 2F And the image <clears throat> is now formed uh, almost the reverse of this one. Okay, so if we have an object sitting here somewhere, let's suppose, what happens with these rays is they behave the opposite. So if we have, for example, uh, a, a ray parallel here like this, it will be diverged <clears throat> and such that it would, this divergence would go through the focus. Uh, we would have still this situation would not change and um, <clears throat> so let's see if we can divine and we can already see it here if we extrapolate this ray you will see that we get a very small image here now <clears throat> this particular lens this diverging lens it's also known as a Barlow lens <clears throat> and once again we have a virtual image it's smaller It's inside F, and the image is erect. Now you might say to me, well, this is a very strange thing. I mean, I understand magnifying glass, that makes perfect sense, but my gosh, who would ever want to use something like this? You may be surprised, okay? Now let's, uh, we'll leave this uh, as a little bit of a suspense here, but we'll look at that too. Let's look at a different example entirely. <clears throat> something you may well have seen as a child when you've gone swimming or something. <clears throat> we have a pool. Actually, I'm going to redraw that a little bit different. <clears throat> and because we're Canadian, we have a hockey puck sitting on the bottom of the pool 
And <clears throat> what you're going to find and what you notice is the hockey puck does not appear as deep as we know the pool to be. So you're up here looking down at the pool, the observer's eye, and let's see what happens. <clears throat> so rays from the puck will come up almost vertically, but we're coming from a slow medium to a fast one, so they diverge a little bit. This is enhanced, of course, just to show it to you. And what you don't know that, so then what you see is this. This is where the hockey puck forms <clears throat> for the observer. Now this is enhanced, it's not that obvious. And the same thing happens, <clears throat> uh, for example, in the islands where spear fishing occurs. If you, you can see it here, that the puck, if you were, let's just draw it on the same, um, the same map here, we have our fish. And the rays from the fish, you know, come up like this and are bent this way to our fisherman, which will draw yet again another eye here. And if uh, they were to throw the spear where the fish appears to be, the spear will miss over top of the fish. <clears throat> and they'll starve. So these people learn quickly when they're training as child children that when you see the fish you aim below it because the uh, uh, optical effects of the surface are fooling you. Let's look at some other basic phenomena too that happen. You might say if you are it's a little bit difficult when you're swimming because of your the way the water goes up your nose and so on. But if you were able to lie, um, go underwater, and look back up at the surface, uh, it's an interesting effect because, and this is to be when the water's calm. If the water is turbulent, then of course the lens, if you will, is being radically distorted. But if you can look <clears throat> upward. On a, uh, it is an effect of magnification. Okay, you're going to see uh, the sky uh, closer. It's going to give you a bit of a prescription. Some of you uh, may notice if you're myopic when you go swimming, if you open your eyes underwater, that you see a little better. <clears throat> It'll depend on your pres pres prescription. But you have a cornea water relationship versus a cornea air relationship, and so the effect of how the light rays are bent is different, not as dramatic. So it's kind of interesting <clears throat> how these things look. Another thing we can talk about is uh, examples of just these types of basic technologies would be uh, on a car, <clears throat> you have a window and when it's raining, the view of the road is blurred. And so we have a safety device called a windshield wiper <clears throat> and it removes uh, the water. But let's look at why this is necessary. <clears throat> Why is a fluid? It's just going to run off your window anyway. What's the point? In most vehicles, the windshield has sufficient slant to it, and you're not going fast enough that the water forms little balls, little beads, like so. And <clears throat> this is so these water beads, or whatever you want to call them 
is due to something called surface tension. And this is a tendency for water and other liquids to, um, <clears throat> to cling to things. And when they do, they tend to form these spherical round balls. And uh, this is uh, a property of, of these materials. And this, of course, is one of the reasons, say, for example, why certain insects can walk across water um, and, and so on. And it's just one of these properties. But what it does in our case is that these things form random <clears throat> lenses. And when they do that, of course, they distort in real time our view of the road. Now the wiper <clears throat> removes the bulk of the water and then the lens effect is vastly reduced. So it is interesting that we study these things, but lenses of different kinds form naturally in nature and can be useful or otherwise. Sometimes the water droplets form on plant leaves, form a lens which causes the sun to burn a hole in the leaf. It'll just depend on the accident of, of the angle of the leaf and how big the drop is and all the rest uh, as to whether this happens before the water evaporates in general. So it's quite interesting, I think, how these things work. Okay, so let's look at this situation. If we have our equation we had before, high over ho equals negative di over do, <clears throat> it works fine. The problem is, is that the height of the images are values that are difficult sometimes to measure. And so we would want to try to rearrange our algebra if we can, so that we can get away from having those variables in our actual equation. Well, let's look at the typical lens situation. We have the object at 2 plus 2f here, and the image, therefore, between f and 2f. And we're going to mainly deal with these two triangles here. So we've got the ray coming to the lens, refracting through the focus and continuing on, and we have the image here. We could argue that these two triangles are similar. We have a uh, opposite angle here, and because this is vertical and the lens is erect, we have this angle and this angle here are also equal due to transversal parallel line theorem. This is also 90 and this is also 90. So one way or the other, these two triangles are similar. This puts them into <clears throat> a particular ratio. So we have the height and the height of the object ratios and we have the race of the length, and this is where it gets interesting. So <clears throat> what we're going to have in this particular case is we'll write again once again, high over ho equals. Now once again, this is uh, inverted to this one, so the sign must switch. So we're going to say negative, and this distance from the focus to the image is simply di minus f, where this is the distance from the optical center to the focus, called the focal length, you may have heard before. So we'll have di minus f here, divided by, <clears throat> and then the distance from here to here, of course, is simply f. Okay, now, but we also know that high over ho is equal to negative di over do, and this is the substitution that we now make. So negative di over do uh, equals negative di minus f over f. So we could write it that way. Uh, and <clears throat> we just want to be careful changing these signs too much and getting too clever.
We certainly can multiply through here and get one where we would have f minus die. That one's fine. <clears throat> So let's cross multiply and see what we get here. So we're going to get minus di f equals do f minus do di. I uh, miss. No, that's right. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, yes, do F, here we go, there we go. So now we want to combine these two, <clears throat> so we'd end up with something like this. Uh, do die is equal to do F plus, I'm sorry, this would be plus here too, uh, die F. So get rid of the negatives, move things around. And then we can, once again, take F, do plus die, is equal to do die and we would have f equals do die divided by do plus die however you may notice the pattern here and we can write and we tend to write it this way instead now this is known as the lens makers equation or the thin lens, something like that. Okay, and it's used. And so what's nice about this is that the image sizes, which are still can be computed from up here, are now determined by how far you are away from something, uh, where how, and the distance of the image, oftentimes if you have a camera or something, it's going to be fixed or pretty close to it. You're not going to have much difference in distance uh, so this does constrain things and make it a bit easier. But remember also, when we focus our camera, such as we, we turn a ring or something, we're literally moving the lens. So that adjusts this distance of the image somewhat as a function of focus, focal length. And this, of course, then would be sensitive to the distance of the image. And this is why you focus a camera. So hopefully that gives you that perspective on all of this. It's quite amazing actually. So we should discuss briefly some issues with lenses. The first one is what we call chromatic aberration. And this is simply that the index of refraction is truly a function of the wavelength and so what you get if you have a lens like so is that down here the blues and the reds to take the opposite ends of the spectrum are so your reds are fairly long the blues get refracted more aggressively like so so your object <clears throat> If you focus, so we generally, humans, uh, focus to yellow-green. That's the area of our eye that's most sensitive. It's because it's the same as the sun. And so we have our object. Okay. And what you find around it is a purple haze. So you get a because where it is in focus for the yellow green if you see arbitrarily here okay then the reds and the blues will both be out of focus slightly. The distances are obviously much smaller than I'm drawing on this just for representation purposes. And uh, now this is, recreationally, is irrelevant. <clears throat> so recreationally, uh, a nuisance, if anything. 
but scientifically it's unacceptable. Because uh, we take spectra observations are impaired. And we can't have that. So if we do this type of work, we have to correct it with extra optics. So the correction <clears throat> is uh, subsequent lenses. which <clears throat> attempt to cancel this out. So with a, take a telescope, for example, you have your first lens, say, you might have two or three other lenses that are part of it that might be right behind it like this. So this is a what we call a doublet. And this can be it's a different shape. And it may well be different glass. Now the smart people figure out how to do this. Okay? But <clears throat> this is the challenge that we have here with the uh, with this type of work and and this can be true it doesn't have to just be telescopes you can have objects uh, even in medicine if a surgeon is looking through optics uh, to operate on someone they can they cannot have uh, blurs or ghost images or whatever and this is why you have to pay okay so for this type of stuff you are looking at a lot of money so you might go somewhere and buy a set of binoculars or a telescope or something and for maybe a few hundred dollars and think you've done well. Uh, when the scientific standard might be um, 10 or even 50 times more expensive or more uh, depending on the circumstance and what is being asked of it and the obligations. Remember also as we'll talk about in grade 11 physics when we deal with uncertainties and you see this even with the COVID crisis. And again, the challenge of the COVID crisis is to know what the uncertainties are. So that's a different discussion. But uh, if we know what the uncertainties are, then we have to look at the consequences. Because if the consequence is catastrophic, um, massive personal injury, death, uh, massive economic uh, consequence, etc., then we just it can't happen. We have to do everything realistically possible to prevent it. Um, if we look at and are we our mindsets are different about these things so for example a car is still a very uh, well-made piece of machinery we expect our cars to for the most part work every time we get in them and drive away we don't expect our car to break one day out of ten if it if it did we would consider it a lemon but if you think about what's being asked of the car to work under those conditions with comparatively minimal maintenance and even though the operating manual of the car has standards of what you're supposed to do uh, most people don't bother and until it actually breaks but if the car does break what happens well it slows down and pulls over on the side of the road generally speaking stops working but you're on the ground so the, the biggest real hassle is the inconvenience you have to phone for assistance, the car is towed, you have to pay a repair bill, wherever you were going, you have to make adjustments. It's a frustrating day because this car for once has not has let you down. But if we're flying on a jetliner and something fails and the aircraft can't continue, then we have catastrophe, not only in the air with the people on board, but also on the ground. And, and so from a human standpoint, we don't want that. We think that's unacceptable. And so we, the standards for aircraft maintenance and production and all the rest are, are vastly higher than they are for cars. 
And that's also it's also a business issue too, because if you think about it from the airplane standpoint, the airlines, you know, killing your customers is bad for business. So they don't want anything to go wrong either. So they're quite willing to to support these things. Um, and so this is why you pay a lot of money, a lot more money than the average person might think you need to pay uh, for some of these devices <clears throat> if they are working in high dependent areas such as medicine or you're trying to get very very precise scientific measurements and whomever the government and so forth has decided that those are valuable so then then the money is spent to get a device such as the Hubble Space Telescope that is so precise and so well crafted they, they say that the Hubble Space Telescope's mirror was the size of the United States that the biggest bump on it would be no more than 10 centimeters and that's a truly incredible accomplishment but you pay for that, okay? And that's that's what billions of dollars buys you. Okay, uh, we're going to uh, move on uh, in this study, uh, but this is the story of simple lenses, and uh, thank you for watching. Now, the lens that I have made for you is the spherical, or in this case, biconvex lens. And we use these lenses and design them primarily because they're very easy to make. A spherical, well, comparatively easy to make anyway. When we get into complicated uh, surfaces, be it mirrors or lenses, uh, the effort to make them for many years was very difficult. Now today with computer polishing and so forth, you can simply put the equation in, the computer will polish whatever shape you want to. But certainly for the last, um, say for up to the, say the end of the century, uh, this was work. So this leads to a problem. So we have our principal axis through here. If we take the gross spherical shape, what will happen is the rays at the extreme edge get focused a little bit shorter than the rays that are closer to the, surf to the center. And so we do not have, <clears throat> so we have no sharp focus. And the problem primarily lies from about here to here, so that this range outside. And <clears throat> worse. As the focal ratio uh, drops so this is the focal length divided by the aperture or the lens diameter okay if this is less than six this is uh, then spherical aberration is a problem now it's always a problem but it's a bigger problem okay and so <clears throat> The problem, of course, is, is that uh, for a lot of professional astronomers and so forth, the telescopes are comparatively short and very big in the size. And so you, you have to correct for this because you know it's going to happen. So this zone here that drew, this is greatly exaggerated. And so this is known as spherical aberration. <clears throat> but it is also a term that's used sometimes for optics and systems that are created where a mistake has been made, which leads to the same problem here, where you can't get the rays to focus as you had in mind. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope was designed uh, as one of the most precise optical instruments ever. And it was launched in 1990. Um, after a few months, they got sorted out, they were trying to focus the telescope, and they could not get a sharp focus. And they did everything they could, but no matter what they did, the images were soft, they were blurry a little bit. Certainly not adequate for the um, $3 billion price tag of the telescope. So, the reason it happened was, and now this is a lens, but if you can imagine a mirror here, that's 2.4 meters in diameter and it was made uh, by the end of the mirror 
uh, half the width of a human hair, about 25 microns, uh, too flat. And as such, you had this effect to a, an extent that was intolerable. So this is great um, consternation over this problem. And uh, three years was involved was involved in first figuring what to do and then coming up with the equipment, training the astronauts to send up a rescue mission. Now there were other problems with telescopes as well, but this was the primary issue that we had to deal with. Obviously this huge mirror, the idea that the astronauts could somehow open up the telescope, remove this huge mirror that's in the center of the telescope, take it up, put a new one in, it just seemed to be unreasonable. So that was not going to happen. However, this was one of the most precisely made mirrors in history. And so the thinking was, is that since we know how precise it is, if we carefully analyze the images we're getting, we should be able to try and correct for this. And that's exactly what they did. And so they uh, brought a device up called CoStar, which put lenses in front of the rays, which refocused the light when it went off to the spectrograph and so forth. And uh, so it's a pretty amazing uh, save, if you will, of a problem like that. So this is just an example, uh, and, and like I said before, it, it, the primary reason is just like if those of you in mathematics, uh, you'll have learned little math tricks that were used for years before we got calculation engines and computers where we don't have to really bother with them anymore. Okay, so let's move on then to the human eye. Now the biologists are going to tell you lots of things about the... Uh, the eye, we're going to deal with the physics aspect of it, okay? And so, your eye, remember, is not just a projection screen. Your eye has two lenses, basically, two optical elements, and it has this incredibly delicate membrane at the back that is your screen and your optical sensor screen. So let's just look at a few things here. Uh, first we have the optical nerve, the optic nerve. Depending on who you talk to, uh, vision might be as much as 80% of the brain activity at a given time. This is quite a substantial diameter nerve. If the eyeball is say two to three centimeters in diameter. I've seen optic nerves that are five millimeters in diameter. So, so they're quite significant in size. The uh, sensory screen we use called the retina, which is incredibly delicate. So if you get troubles in here, you can't replace this fluid very easily because just the act of doing that will cause the retina to tear. As you get older, sometimes the retina will tear, uh, affecting your vision. So these are all things we have to can be issues of the eye. This is the iris. This is the lens. This is the cornea. Now in addition to the structures, we need to keep the eye to keep its shape so that this distance here is preserved and so forth and this distance is preserved. So these both areas are filled with a fluid and fluids of course are effectively incompressible so that the shape will be maintained and of course the outside covering of the eyes called the sclera is an extremely tough material uh, so the large area is the vitreous humor it's a gelatin water type material okay and then this one here the spacing between the uh, cornea and the eye lens is called the aqueous humor. And so let's have a look at just what goes on here. The cornea. This is the primary optic. And the lens is the fine, the fine tuning, if you will, of focus. However, the lens in an eye is really quite remarkable. 
when we focus, so to speak, our camera lenses or our what have you, uh, we will we'll rotate a ring, which is just a threaded uh, ring, and it moves the lenses back and forth and changing their circumstance. Here, we don't do that at all. The uh, muscles of the iris change the shape of the lens, something we never do with our technology. And this allows the focal length of the lens to change. And so that's a pretty amazing thing. Um, and so this is the basics of how the eye works. So you would end up with a, a, a got a compound lens system here, and this is this is complicated. But what happens is the light will come in <clears throat> to the eye, and you will get some type of an image forming here. The image will be upside down. But your brain is easy to fix that. And this is why you can watch television from the Chesterfield or from um, a lion or bed lying sideways. Your brain can quickly figure out what's supposed to, you know what the people are vertical and so on and you just do the mental switch in your head. Now let's have a look a bit more detail here. I want to talk a bit more about how the lens works. So the lens for far vision is basically flat. And so what happens is there's ligaments behind the iris that stretch the lens. And what this, this results in distance vision is effortless. So if you think about it, the only time you have to <clears throat> focus your eyes or make some kind of effort is when you're working on something really close. Your eye will get fatigue from being on the computer screen or something or doing uh, some type of fine work for a while, but you never get eye fatigue because you went for a walk and you were looking at the scenery. Uh, so near vision. The <clears throat> iris muscles or muscle uh, pulls against the ligaments and my memory tells me they're like in a spiral shape so there's a bit of flexibility there <clears throat> to make the lens more spherical. Okay, <clears throat> and, and that's in general how our eye works. Okay, so if you're reading a book, this is what's happening. As soon as you put the book down, it goes back to this, the muscles relax. Now we'll talk about um, eye disorders in a minute, but let's just look about one that's related to this. So it's well could be that your parents or certainly your grandparents will have um, age-induced um, hyperopia, okay? I think that's called hypertropia. So this is age-induced farsightedness.
And generally speaking, <clears throat> this leads to what people call reading glasses. Now this effect will occur very quickly. Okay, the degradation. is rapid probably within about three weeks or less so you're reading and finally and suddenly you realize you can't read the documents anymore uh, in the old days sometimes if people would uh, uh, move papers back and forth to focus and the joke would be this is playing trombone <clears throat> and it's just a wry comment on the vagaries of getting older but the point here is from a science standpoint is what's going on well what happens is as you age connective tissue in this case ligaments, <clears throat> uh, are less, are more dry. And from that, less flexible. Now this is progressive. But what will happen is, is that on, uh, at onset, the muscles, which are roughly constant, uh, can no longer reshape the lens. to the same extent. And so what would happen is that <clears throat> they would, uh, they'll restrape it somewhat. So for example, you might be able to uh, watch the television still. You might even be able to use a computer if it's not too close. Uh, things like that. You might not be able to see the keyboard, but you might be able to see the screen. <clears throat> um, and uh, you might be able to get around the kitchen fairly well, but you're not going to see the recipe uh, or the details of, say, icing a cake or something like that. Uh, so there is some improvement. And so this is where we have to intervene. And like I said to you earlier, this is one of the first uh, true successes of technology in improving the lives of people from the standpoint of direct health intervention. I'm not talking about, you know, water systems or fire or whatever. So let's have a look at the different cases. So let's start off with the most common case, which is myopia. And here, what's happening is the following. So we have our lens and make the eye a little smaller than we did before to show the effect. So we put this in the wrong place. Let's try again. <clears throat> and we have our retina. <clears throat> now, in this case, when the way the eyes sorted out, it is considered what they will tell you. Whether it's completely true or not, I don't know. They'll say to you, the eyeball is oblong. So it's, it's oval in the vertical sense. Now, you could say, well, it's gravity, which is silly because this is a pressurized orb and gravity's not going to make a material effect on it. So whether this is exactly what's happening or we have actual prescription effects here in the eye is more or less the same shape as for somebody else to decide. But so what is happening then? If this distance is too far here, is when we have the um, 
the rays come through, we're getting an image of the tree in front of the retina. And this is uh, so uh, sufficiently far ahead, this is not correctable by the lens. Now, again, uh, a more scientific history of myopia would probably tell us more. Many students, many young people pick up their glasses when they're in grade two, three, four, when they're very young. Um, I was uh, getting glasses in the summer, or the early fall of grade two, uh, and I've worn them ever since. Uh, we understand these, there's a genetic component to this, as I think I mentioned in my earlier uh, lesson. But of course, in all of this, this is probability. Uh, my history, my particular culture, my father came from Holland. Uh, in my father's family, uh, ignoring age onset, there may be, I'm not sure if anyone in his direct blood lineage wore glasses that, at least in the generations I'm aware of. Uh, my mother's side, um, again, there are very few people uh, in my mother's side that I can remember who are myopic, who are directly related in my bloodline. So I'm an anomaly in my family, uh, and that's just how it goes sometimes. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you're Asian, uh, you may, there might be as much as 80% incidence of myopia in that particular race. Who knows? Uh, Native North Americans have almost none, uh, and, so, and everyone else somewhere in between. So it's just an interesting effect. Mercifully, it is easily fixed. So what we have to do here is we want to move the focus back so that the image will rest on the retina. Now, you'll sit in front of the, uh, the eye doctor's office and they will flick through all the different lenses to get you where you want to go. But let's look at what we need to do here. We need a diverging lens. And so the lens that is used for myopes is actually this lens that when we first saw, we thought, who would ever use that? We need to diverge. And so when this is used, uh, it will diverge, and this is grossly exa exaggerated, the rays like so, and then when that comes in here, uh, it's going to cause the uh, the tree to form further back and based on input from the user you will get they will pick the optic for you now remember that the, the current situation to for making glasses at reasonable prices is they have a whole bunch of lenses in steps and they flick through them until they find the one that you like the best which is as close as it can be and then they write those numbers down and then the optician goes in the back, finds that stock lens, cuts it to the shape of your eyeglasses, and off you go, more or less. Now, so this is how myopia is cured. Now, let's look at a couple of other things. Uh, we have, of course, eyeglasses. Let's look at uh, contact lenses uh, and also eye surgery and what's, invo what's involved. Okay, but my panel is so small, I'll do them as they come. So we're just going to, now we understand the optical path we're trying to do, we're still going to do exactly the same thing with each one. So we take a contact lens. So here's the cornea. Now, here you're going to have a lens that's going to be convex, concave, pardon me, on top of it in some way. If you have contact lenses, one of the things that they will tell you is do you have to be very, very clean? And that's because no dirt permitted. And scratches of your cornea are permanent. Okay. So if you work in a dusty environment, if you're a tradesperson, 
um, or whatever and this could include even things like bakeries and so forth too uh, if there's any kind of dust I wouldn't be wearing contacts I'd be wearing regular glasses okay so so you want to uh, mindful of dust okay and your eyes there's issues here I'm not an, an expert on the cells of the cornea but these are to come out at night and give your eyes a rest and you can put them back in in the morning again okay and all that will be told to you by your eye your optician the last example in our time is of course where we actually sculpt the cornea so you have your cornea oops let's get it there we go and here we have surgery So what's going to happen here is they're going to they're going to with their amazing tools they're going to peel back a flap on the cornea. They're going to take the laser and they're going to re-sculpt this shape here. Okay, and then when finished, this will then go back down again and heal within a day or two. Now, of course, this is a uh, type of surgery you do have to be sedated, and everyone, and I mean everyone, cherishes their sight. It is one of the most profound sentences we have and one of the most profound things that gives us a quality of life. And so to allow um, a surgeon to cut out your eyes uh, takes a certain amount of courage that not all of us have. Well, let's summarize what's going on with these. So we have glasses or spectacles. We have contact lenses. And we have surgery. Now, surgery, uh, first off, is expensive. So there has to be a good reason for it. I mean, if you're going to buy glasses for $250, $400, and surgery is $5,000 an eye, I mean, you better have a good reason, okay? So this can be job related. It can be, you could be, um, uh, can't wear. glasses due to job so this could be um, um, breathing equipment or something like that uh, diving it's not that you can't it's just hard and inconvenient so this is a way around it um, and of course, in extreme cases, for people with too much money, vanity. They just don't wish to wear glasses. In the very few cases of people, for appearance purposes, you're in uh, you're a model, or in the movies, or you're on the television for some reason, and your appearance is part of you know the, your package, so to speak. Then sometimes these things are done as well. Contact lenses are uh, uh, similar in price. To glasses so this is back to the mere mortal category here um, however in my view we have to be very careful with dirt uh, now and if they are lost hard to find now you can bring a spare set and of course you might want to do that so imagine you're depending on where you are if you're driving okay and something happens and you lose a spec you lose a contact lens or something like that, depending on how best of bad your prescription is it's a problem 
Now, legally you have to have it dry, but even if you try to get to the next place, you may or may not be able to see well enough. Um, I personally, well I'll, I'll say my own personal views in a minute here. Um, now these are uh, fairly uh, so in inexpensive in comparison. And they're easily found. Uh, repairs are possible. They used to be more possible than they are now, but they were there. And there's some protection. And uh, can be cleaned. So it depends on your lifestyle. If you are uh, outside with uh, or sports related, an active lifestyle, uh, or you're on a farm or somewhere like this where there's dust and so forth, I'd be wearing glasses um, because ignoring the expense. So the camera quit on me, unfortunately, if I didn't realize it at the end of the uh, comparison there. But just for me, if I look at the um, lens uh, surgery aspect of it. Uh, first, I'm 60, and I don't see the point. Uh, at 5,000 an eye, I think you have to have a really good reason to do it. I don't. Uh, contacts, I'm outside a lot. I do things a lot. I think fiddling around with it a lot is not something that appeals to me. Um, and all the advantages I listed there of glasses, the protection, the easy to clean, the repairability, and all the rest of it. Um, and I don't even know I'm wearing them when I have them on. Uh, and as I've said to many before, when you look like I do, what would be the point anyway? So I've been wearing glasses for over 50 years and will continue to do so. Um, one of the things that happens also with people who do the surgery and they're young, in their 20s or something, for the, because they have the resources or because of a job or something, uh, they'll still have to wear reading glasses when they get older. And so it well couldn't be that you only delay the reality of your eyes um, not being um, up to focus and so forth. Okay, let's look at the other problem now where the focus uh, of the image is behind the retina. They will tell you the eye uh, is shaped vertically. It may be, it may not be. It seems a bit of an odd thing. Um, but regardless, the image lies behind the retina. I would suggest that the prescription of the cornea and the lens is simply not enough to do the job, however way the eye was formed. And so what we want to do then is we'll use now a convex lens because we want to converge the rays such that we get an image on the retina proper. Okay, and this is exactly the same problem whether it's the, the uh, birth defect where you're, the eye is shaped in such a way the lens forms behind or because the lens can no longer correct sufficiently when you're reading that the image starts to form behind the eye. Uh, either way, um, you're still stuck with needing some help. Now these prescriptions uh, are comparatively common and so where years ago everybody had um, to go to the eye doctor to get reading glasses. It was, was almost uniform. Today you buy them at the drugstore. There's a whole bunch of them with typical prescriptions and you simply put them on uh, because uh, they're f far less customizable necessarily. Um, anyhow, so this is an example you see of uh, the other version. Now one of the things uh, that may surprise you as well is uh, that um, we've studied this magnifying glass thing and then you find out that the lenses of Vera Myop are actually diverging lenses. Now you can check this and you may have noticed it before. Uh, if you take your fingers carefully at the center of your lens and notice that the outsides are thicker. Okay which of course is the point of a diverging lens. Now your lens is curved because of the small hole of the pupil and all that gets very complicated, but that's another day. Um, a couple of other eye disorders I just wanted to briefly mention. We have first cataracts. And this is a clouding of the lens. And this is generally speaking 
um, an age disease. And the other thing that can happen, of course, is um, UV exposure. Okay, and this can be welding. Or, uh, in some cases, uh, sun. So you need to uh, be mindful of this. Uh, and this is one of the reasons a welder has to wear eye protection is because the arc itself is emitting a tremendous amount of ultraviolet light which is very dangerous to biological systems it will break chemical bonds down and damage the tissues um, quite easily uh, your eyes I'm uh, sorry your lens of your eye is susceptible to this and uh, so wearing the welding protection not some crap that you've borrowed but the right stuff is worth it especially if you make a career in this and remember that welding arcs from the side, from somebody else's welding arc, uh, all the rest of it, all those flashes all affect your eyes, not just the one you're working on in front of you. If you're a surfer, if you are a skier uh, in places, if you other, or uh, out on the water a lot uh, and so forth and a great deal of sun and so forth, you may want to consider increased protections for the lenses of your uh, glasses or your sunglasses because this can cause some problems. And the other uh, disease that I'll mention that's not really physics related, but well, it's slightly so, I guess, is glaucoma. And this is an increased pressure in the eyeball. And this will kill the retina. The retina is unbelievably delicate. Um, if you cut eyes open of uh, animals or something like that, often if you're not careful, the retina will come out like a black cream, like it won't even hold its structure. Um, and so when you increase the pressure in here, okay, this is in increasing the stress on this incredibly delicate membrane. Okay, so you may well have everything else working well, but the actual sensor system that's sending off to the brain uh, will be failed and so we have to we, we watch that now they used to um, test it with a small weight on the eye which is very disconcerting but now they just do it with a puff of air it's quite amazing uh, going to the eye doctor is really a high-tech adventure now it's well worth the, 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 the chance to do so and you should have your eyes checked on a reasonable basis um, certainly uh, every five years if you're young and, and uh, or sooner if you have difficulties don't leave it um, another uh, disease you hear of is macular degeneration. And what you have is this region right here. This is called the maculus or the fovea centralis. Now, the main point here is that your eye experiences spherical aberration as well. So if you look to the right or the left, you'll notice you can see stuff, but it's not in focus. Okay, so focus is dead ahead. And if you're going to focus on something, you have to turn your head or your eyes or something to, to scope it out. And when the maculus dies. Now this vision is lost, except at the periphery. So you have a, a concentration of cones here which is color vision, of course, uh, and, and far less so, and way more of rods at the extreme sides. And of course, because the focus is not very good on the outside rear, you're seeing, uh, you're, you have some peripheral vision, you can see motion, 
and things happening and, and a little bit of color but not very much if you wave something right at the edge of your vision oftentimes you can't tell the difference in its color unless it's extremely vivid but um, when the maculus dies you lose that vision in the center of your eye and if you can you know put your fist up or something like that and just imagine seeing only around the edges and then of course with the limited focus that you would have in that condition it's a pretty frustrating um, situation and depending on it can go further uh, and you can be basically blind or you can basically only see like uh, different levels of, uh, of brightness but not any focused and so it can be very debilitating this is currently a disease that they can see coming but I don't believe there's too much we can do about it hopefully with modern technology we can you might ask me since we're finishing up on this right now what about uh, artificial eyes? We have artificial other things. Uh, well, the answer is simply this. Uh, we, we could make all of this pretty well. Um, that, that could happen. Uh, I, I did neglect to mention with cataracts, so the, if you have a clouded lens and you can't see, which is kind of bad, they give you a new lens. Uh, they, have, they can make them or they have, um, and just drop it in. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, and they can actually give sight back to people. Sometimes you need glasses, but generally speaking, you can move ahead. Um, but let's say an artificial eye. Uh, here's the challenge for everyone. You can make this device. That, that wouldn't be um, too big a stretch. But how do we code the information in this optic nerve, the, the connection between our bionic eye, so to speak, and the brain. How do we tell the brain what we're seeing in a way that the brain will understand it? I think that's where we're really stuck. Um, it's the same with myoelectric arms, uh, artificial arms and so forth. They can be very amazing. But how do, you, how do you connect those mechanical devices to the nervous system of the body so that a person can command the motion of that arm as they had in the past or sense feeling. Okay, so there's this connection to the nervous system that's really the big trick. I'm not saying it can't be done, I'm just saying that's, that's where the problems lie. So we'll talk a little bit about reflections now <clears throat> and how we can generate similar results. First we have the fundamental law of reflection here <clears throat> this mirror is flat so you hear the word plain mirror a and e uh, which implies the geometric implication of it being a plane uh, if you have a normal here constructed uh, at the point of where the light ray strikes the mirror you will get a reflection where the angle of incidence here is equal to the angle of reflection once again measured from the normal to the ray uh, so we can get images uh, like that. So, for example, this is the typical bathroom mirror situation. And we have our arrow and our eye. So the rays come from the tip of the arrow into the eye, from the foot of the arrow into the eye. But, of course, our eye has no idea uh, when we view it, <clears throat> there's a reflection. And so what happens is the uh, ray appears, the, the light ray appears to form an image behind the mirror uh, where we see it. Okay, and, uh, and this is typical. I guess I've drawn this wrong. So I'll show you my mistakes and that way you can make them yourself. So of course it's, got, it's not focused on the object, it's going to be what we think so here's a situation where you have the the rays extending and just like the the puck in the water example I gave earlier you're not going to know that the ray has been reflected so um, we're running out of space here so we'll just give up on this let's um, let's just redraw it a little take a little bit of liberty here so here's the ray and you can make that geometric connection there and then with a bit of liberty here we will get this 
So the eye sees this ray continuing on behind the mirror, not recognizing that it's been reflected. It's been completely fooled by that, understandably, which is why you make, that's the whole point of making the mirror. Uh, from artistic standpoints, too, mirrors are often used in rooms to make the room appear larger, okay, than it otherwise would be. So you see these things in smaller rooms, sometimes in RVs or in smaller bedrooms and so forth, where the or, or other types of rooms where you want to have make the room look a little bigger than it otherwise would be. Now we can move from these flat mirrors, which provide clearly no magnification. When you look into the um, mirror in the bathroom, you see the same things at the same size. If we have a mirror that's say it curved like this. Uh, what happens when there's an incident ray? Let's say here's a ray coming like so. And it will bounce off like this. The angle of incidence reflection is based on the inc on the plane that's tangent at the point of, of the contact. Okay? So uh, angle I equals angle R <clears throat> okay based on the tangent plane at the point of contact and uh, so taking this information, which is fairly easy to, to discover by experiment, we can now look and see what is producible. Once again, we'll use spherical mirrors because they're again easy to make. And we'll draw one in here like so. In fact, this time, well, we'll draw it like this. Actually, no, we won't. We'll draw it because uh, you don't see through the mirror, obviously. So we will uh, draw the mirror a little further down here. Now, here we have the center of curvature. This is C. So a distance from C to the mirror is the radius of curvature. And a ray from C to the mirror at the appropriate location will always produce a right angle. Halfway down, we have F. And there's a theorem in geometry which will tell you that if you send a ray parallel, it will come back through at the distance half that of the, uh, <clears throat> of the radius of curvature. Uh, now, Euclidean geometry theories are not uppermost in my mind, but you understand. So let's take, just like we did before, we'll take our, our object here beyond C, and once again we're going to deal with very similar guidelines. We're going to have a ray parallel to the principal axis is refracted through the focus and vice versa. A ray from C perpendicular to the mirror reflects back through C. Well, that's about it. And let's see if we can achieve something useful here. So we'll take first a parallel ray here and it will come back through the focus. Of course the line is a bit drunken here but we'll live with that. And we'll take another ray goes through the focus that is now reflected back parallel. And once again we get that crossing here which means that all the rays from the point of the arrow end up here, and if you followed the rest of the arrow, you would obtain an image in this location. So very, very similar to the refracted ray. Okay, <clears throat> very, very similar situation. Now, we have, of course, uh, the object where it is further away than C comes in and is smaller or we have a smaller object which is made bigger. So a smaller object 
reflected into a bigger object like this it would be like a searchlight or a headlight or something like that. A large object coming back in to a smaller image would be the beginnings of a telescope, a mirror-based telescope or something like that. Um, <clears throat> if they're at C, it's equal. That's pretty obvious. At F, we get no image at all. So let's move ahead now to what happens when we're at the focus or be inside the focus. So with the situation where it is closer than the focus, so here's our mirror, here's the focus, here's the object. We, it's a little trickier to see what's going on. And it's based on the same type of tracing that we did with the object in front of the mirror, uh, the plane mirror. But this time, of course, because the mirrors curve, things are a bit different. So let's. So we're viewing it from the same side as the mirror, obviously. So we put this object here, but the object will appear larger behind. Now let's just look and see how we follow our principles. So first we have the tip here. We have a ray coming from the tip, hitting the mirror, going back through the focus and going on forever. We have a ray coming and hitting the center of the mirror and, reflect, and reflecting back through the point, which of course could happen. Uh, and we have a ray from the focus through the tip that hits the mirror and goes back parallel. Now, of course, when you look at the mirror from here, uh, from, from the point of the eye, you don't know about this bending stuff. What you're seeing, what you see is the extrapolation of the rays, this ray, this ray, uh, and this one through through the mirror. So what you'll see then, these all converge here by extrapolation to a point here where in this area here all the information comes from the tip of the arrow and you can extrapolate that down and gives you an image of an arrow and this makes a, a magnified image. Now this is used um, for a cosmetic mirror Now the ability of the human eye to perceive uh, the, the detail is a function of the smallest possible angle. So if you start with the, the eye at one side of the room and look across the room at, at uh, printing on the wall, uh, you have a very, very narrow isosceles triangle. And the small angle at the, t at the tip of that triangle, as it gets smaller, is a point where your eye can no longer distinguish information. It's no longer just the thickness of the letter. It has to be much less than that because you're looking for information so you can understand if it's a P or a C or whatever. So the trick played by um, the uh, entertainment industry and, and uh, um, arguably ladies in general who, who do use cosmetics is that if you make the person up using an enlarged mirror, a magnified image, okay, of their circumstance, and that looks perfect. That is at a resolution that's probably double or triple what the average person is going to see. And most people are not that close to you either. They're, they're further away. So that means then that the uh, cosmetic effect, be it just for general vanity or for uh, uh, entertainment purposes such as a costume or something, will have the desired effect because it's over-designed is effective at two or three times the resolution that you would ideally get if you were maybe a meter away from that person which you generally won't be if they're on a stage or at a party they're at a few meters away uh, all of their preparations are going to look uh, absolutely perfect within the skill of the cosmetician so it's quite interesting um, okay <clears throat> Now, mirrors suffer from similar problems as the optics do, spherical aberration, uh, the rays coming from these points don't all converge, uh, the tighter, the more of the mirror is curved, you get into bigger troubles. I'm not going to uh, chronicle all of them. Uh, what I propose to do for the rest of this unit, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about compound optics. I want to talk a little bit about 
buying a telescope, uh, which is what some young people will ask uh, Santa Claus for. And then I would like to show you the progress uh, in a PowerPoint, uh, hopefully a PowerPoint video if I can figure out how to do it, uh, that uh, we have made in uh, that type of research in the last 30 years, which is hopefully quite interesting for you. Okay, so first off, compound optics. So if we have our lens, and let's ignore aberrations for now, and we put our eye here, uh, it doesn't work the way you want it to, okay? Uh, it's working with the optics of the eye, but not in the way we want it to, because if these rays form an image, they're divergent, okay? They're diverging rays by the time they get to you. This is a converging lens, but after the crossover here, okay, these rays are diverging. And what the eye wants is it wants more or less parallel rays. So we'll say close to. Or it can't focus. We would also like a few other things. We would like to be able to vary the magnification. Okay, and um, so what happens is the following, is we use a device called an eyepiece. So this, of course, once again, we have our lens. Now we use this eyepiece device, which has three or four elements in it, uh, lenses. <clears throat> And then the view, of course, is after that. So what happens is the primary lens or mirror, whichever, will produce an image about here. And then the eyepiece uses the primary image as a virtual object. And then what it does is it uh, parallels the rays <clears throat> Uh, provides a magnification which we call a power we focus a microscope <clears throat> or a telescope same by adjusting eyepiece location with respect to the primary image. And this is the secret to the microscope and the telescope. And so the eyepiece will have a focal length as well. So let's suppose this one has a focal length, let's say this is an example more or less of a telescope, say of 700 millimeters, 70 centimeters. This might have a focal length here of say 10 millimeters, okay? So the power that we use, which is different than magnification slightly, because it's more complicated, the power then is equal to the focal length of the objective divided by the focal length of the eyepiece which in this example would be 700 divided by 10, or 70x, okay? And, um, and this gives us a, uh, uh, a rough rule on this. Now, let's have a, we're not going to go too far into this, but just to give us an idea, let's look first 
at the basics of the microscope. We don't have to get into late ray tracing particularly, but just to have students always use these things. And so let's just talk about them a little bit. Okay, now we're going to bore everyone with the stage and so forth, <clears throat> but what happens with a microscope is that you have the same pieces. This device, the, the part that you look through, is the eyepiece. And depending on the quality of the microscope, this is often uh, built in. Uh, and some allow Uh, changes. This can be by uh, a new eyepiece that you insert yourself or a lever that switches them inside. Whichever. Um, and But otherwise this is fixed typically. Remember that these optical paths and the perpendicularity, this is all very precise stuff. We can't be messing around taking pieces out of these things. Now these smaller lenses here are the prime lenses, the prime or as we often call them in this world, objective lens. Now <clears throat> these are smaller because it's a microscope. And so <clears throat> magnifying powers is generally uh, selected by changing objectives. <clears throat> and they're near, not exactly, but they're near parfocal. What does that mean? Well, here's the point. Let's suppose you have, you're using <clears throat> your lowest power objective, you have a three turret microscope, and you're looking at uh, an amoeba, and you're, let's say, at 50 times. And you want to rotate this to 100 times to see more detail. What you want is that the lens, the view you get here, is more or less in focus. It might be slightly blurred, but not very much. Because if you go from this to like, blah, okay, and you've got to massively rock the focus <clears throat> to, to get things back, uh, you may not even be looking at the same part of the amoeba, especially under these small conditions. So although it doesn't always happen, that is the suggestion, is the attempt to try to do. So in the case of the microscope, given the very small situation, we have a generally a fixed eyepiece or in rarer cases, either an adjustable one. If it's a lever, the eyepiece again is fixed and the levering is done inside by moving a prism or something. And we rotate this turret, and you'll find when you rotate the turret, it's a very finely machined type rotation system because this is uh, uh, a very precise alignment here, and it can't be, it can't be sloppy or you'll have nothing. Okay, so that's a device that students generally use, and like I say, you are here choosing objectives. Um, the other version, less used by students in schools, but sometimes for recreational purposes, uh, would be the telescope. <clears throat> and so if you have here our objective lens, we're going to have an eyepiece down here somewhere. We'll have a dew shield or something like that to hold things in place. We'll have a tube to keep the light out. And we have our eyepiece. And once again, just like I said earlier, the rays will come in <clears throat> and focus nearby here for this eyepiece to do its thing. And if we're going to focus like we do in the microscope as well, we're going to move this back and forth. And there's usually a knob to do so. However, for telescopes, the situation is reversed. <coughs> <coughs> the objective, <coughs> 
excuse me, lens, <clears throat> or especially the mirror, which is more common, is very large, is quite large. And this is also expensive. <clears throat> so we usually have only one. So a magnification is selected by changing eyepieces. And so the person who has a telescope, <clears throat> you have the telescope, you might get an eyepiece for free with the telescope, but uh, generally you want to see other views. <clears throat> And so uh, then you're looking at um, buying other eyepieces. And so that leads into my final talk on this before we get to the PowerPoint, which is just some background if you were to buy your own telescope, which sometimes happens. So some cautions. <clears throat> so first, spend a summer say 10 nights as a rough idea. Looking at the night sky. with <clears throat> 7 by 50 or 10 by 60 binoculars. Uh, you'll find if you rest them on your eyebrows that's not too difficult lying in a lawn chair. <clears throat> you want to do some study. So find objects slash stars from a star map and of course today these are available online so you can have them on your phone which helps a little bit but the idea is to not so much just to find things but to look at the detail and just see so that you get used to what you can actually see Now you should do some more studying as well, okay? So like any hobby, and this could be sports or chess or knitting, it doesn't have to be astronomy, you have an obligation. So the price of admission is to do some reading, at least in your area of interest. Now, if all this is happening, then we look at the first telescope. Okay. Now, we're going to, uh, this first telescope could be bought when you're 30. It could be bought like it was for me when I was 13. You could have had it given to you. You might have had one when you were six. Uh, it was hard to say. <clears throat> but the the most important principle here, the best telescope for you, is the one you will use. So, think about it for a minute <clears throat> you might have a really fancy complicated crazy digital setup that could do lots of things do you understand how to use it 
and even if you do, how much time does it take to take it out of the storage area, set it all up, calibrate it, organize it, uh, and take the images that you're interested in or whatever observations you want to do. Uh, maybe that's fine for the first few times because it's a novelty, but is that what you are going to be spending some time with? So you need to really look at, at this part. You need to look at your observing site. Are you in a city? <clears throat> Are you at the cottage? How portable is, does your telescope need to be? Now, <clears throat> if you're in the city, okay, you're not going to be seeing uh, you're not going to. You can see planets are fine. Planets, the moon, bright objects like that are fine. You're not going to be seeing galaxies or dim things. So you might as well forget about it. <clears throat> now, of course, if your family is supportive, if you're a youngster still. If your family has a cottage or is willing to make some outings or visit some family or whatever it is where you have dim places, <clears throat> now you can see everything. To the ability of your scope. But then that leads to portable, okay, uh, bulky, large perhaps, uh, heavy. So if the family is going to Grandma's Cottage for the weekend and you want to carry along 150 pounds of telescope equipment, it'll depend on how your family supports you, I suppose, on all of this, okay. But those are the basic things that we want to look at from the standpoint of the basic equipment and decisions that you want to make. So certainly the basic things that we can expect to look at uh, in the sense of the planets. Now you'll all get a glimpse of everything, but the planets that give you any kind of comfort would be Mars. This is fairly difficult. Uh, Jupiter <clears throat> is comparatively easy. Saturn is everyone's favorite. Okay, now Uranus stuff too, way too dim. You're not going to see anything. Uh, Venus will give you an, uh, an arc, and you'll see that for the first time. So Venus can be seen, but there's not a lot of detail there uh, because of the clouds. Uh, I add also here the moon, which is always fun. And, this, and we'll leave the sun out for now. Um, you have to have special filters, and maybe that's not what we should be talking about with the first telescope. What we call deep sky. Are going to be things uh, that, that you have that you can see reasonably with a small telescope would be um, bright nebula. Uh, globular clusters. They show up pretty well. <clears throat> As the two primary ones. Uh, open clusters, if you have the right optics, uh, they're larger space, but they can be very beautiful. Often in binoculars, these are very pretty. Uh, but those are the kinds of basic things. Now, what we have to understand here is galaxies are dim and almost always all you're ever going to see is just the nucleus you're not going to see anything like these fancy pictures that you see on the TV screen okay let's just go so let's go from there so some basic telescopes that you might want to do so just straight you have to deal with a couple of things. Okay, so your optics. <clears throat> Any scope 
So by magnification power, is garbage. Now you have to just use some common sense here. Okay, you're looking at a thousand bucks plus. You're not going to remember, you have to remember that, say Jupiter, okay, just to take a better example here, is 700 million <clears throat> kilometers away on a good day. And you're going to go to the camera store and you're going to spend 100 or 200 bucks at whatever uh, to buy a telescope that's a piece of junk that you're going to look at this thing and the pictures on the box look like NASA space images that cost billions of dollars. Now you're being conned, okay? These telescopes are a misrepresentation of what you can do. So you're going to have to recognize if you're going to spend on anything on this that because what I'm going to tell you is this. Sure, you don't need some of these things, but you look at through your telescope for the first two nights. The next thing you're going to want to do is take a picture. I can tell you right now, you must well just recognize it as a fact of life that within an hour or two of using your telescope, you're going to want to take a picture. So you must well buy something if you have passed the first test that at least allows you to do that. And today with the, car and the digital cameras, it's easier. The second thing you have to consider is your mounting. Now most telescopes today, compared to the good old days, are now what we call go-to telescopes, where the computer finds the objects. Which is pretty cool. And you might say, gee, I, you know, I want to be purist and stuff. Well, you, you can spend a long time being lost, and this is one way where the telescope sets up fairly quickly and you can find a number of, of interesting objects fairly quickly and that can make you feel um, like it adds and so it adds to the it adds to the um, the joy let's say you find more objects and so if we have these computer based telescopes we find uh, more objects. And that's, that's a nice thing. And you can find dim objects that you'd never see on your own. So providing that the system works, and even if you buy one initially that isn't as higher quality, but it, get, it works for a while, maybe it breaks or something, but you begin to find out, gee, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that, seeing these different objects. I really enjoyed that. Then maybe perhaps when you're a professional and you have some more resources, you can spend some more money and get, get a higher quality device. But these are the kinds of things that you need to think about if you're having some choice on this. But you're going to have to look at this number here uh, and recognize, and it's probably going to be closer to 2000 because not only are you going to buy the, the telescope, but you're going to buy accessories. So let me just give you a brief list of the kinds of accessories that a comparatively new telescope owner might have. So you could have additional eyepieces, which I've already mentioned, which are very much part Okay, and these are going to be between 200 and 500 each, depending on the quality and the, what you're asking. Okay, you could have <clears throat> another problem that you'll face is dew removal. Okay, so dew gets on the lenses, dew on mirrors and lenses. And you can't wipe it off. You could scratch something, and when you scratch it, it's scratched forever. So we he use heaters. 
Now these cost money, but then you have the other question is, where does the power come from? Now I built my own heaters in my early days and I'd have everything running off the battery of my car and inevitably at 3 o'clock in the morning I'd have trouble starting the car because I'd basically run the battery down. And that also can ruin the battery of a car because it's not designed for deep discharge. But those are some of the basic things and of course the other thing might be a camera mounting. And again this is not silly expensive perhaps. Uh, and you're also going to have to have some kind of release system because of the vibration. So what this means is that we're going to mount the camera to the telescope physically connected to the telescope. We will fly around, find the object, focus it, all that kind of stuff, be satisfied. But you can't push the button on the camera because when you do it, it jiggles the whole telescope and your image will be garbage. And so instead we use a, uh, a release system that limits the vibration. Now the other thing that you're going to extend from this, and I'm just going to make you aware of it, but it's not probably appropriate for your situation, is dim objects photos require precise tracking. Okay, and that's not going to happen with this setup. You may have a computer drive that will get you close to where you're supposed to be and then you can tweak the telescope to be right square on it. That's fine. And that'll help you find things. But the computer doesn't know where it is it, or exactly where it is and uh, the alignment may not be right on. But to, to take a 5 or 10 or 20 minute image and not have any elongation of images or stars and so forth requires very precise tracking. Now what has happened in the astronomy business is that we actually have um, cameras that are designed only for astronomy and in them with the new telescopes now the camera actually gives the telescope a feedback and keeps the telescope right on the object that we're imaging. Uh, but then you need a, la a laptop at the telescope and it gets quite complicated and expensive so we're not going to cover things like that just now. Another thing that may come in your day, but not just now, would be your own observatory. Now this sounds like really ostentatious, but what you'll find is, as I'll show you, is that a garden shed type observatory is um, maybe a thousand dollars, but the point is, is if your telescope is all set up, you just go out there and use it and you're all set. And that can be really fun. So what I'm gonna do now is, uh, I'm going to give you a tour of my observatory that I built in my home and show you a little bit about what I do and the equipment I have and so forth uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll give you a tour of these um, of how uh, astronomy has changed with the incredible changes of technology over the last 40 years primarily due to the microcomputer. So thank you very much for watching and hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of this section.